In a previous video, I explained how by using Dolby S along with metal tapes, it was possible to make a recording at home onto a cassette that could sound as good as, or depending on who you ask, even better than a compact disc. But unfortunately, neither of these techniques were suitable for the pre-recorded cassettes sold in the stores. In the early 90s, when pre-recorded cassette sales were at their height, very few people owned cassette decks with Dolby S decoding, and the metal tape costs were just too expensive to use for cassettes sold to such a price-conscious market. So in this video, I'm going to talk about a few techniques that manufacturers developed to significantly improve the sound quality of pre-recorded cassettes that worked irrespective of the capabilities of the machine they were being played back in and without adding anything to the end cost of the consumer. Unfortunately though, these improvements arrived at the same time that many people were abandoning the cassette format, so if like me you stopped buying cassettes in the early 90s you might never have experienced these improvements, and that's why I'm going to talk about them here today. The first one of these improvements was a thing known as Digilog. Now, Digilog was a name that Warner Music, or WEA, coined for a technology that's more commonly referred to as a digital bin. Now, to explain what a digital bin is, we'll first have to take a look at the way cassette duplication had worked up until its introduction. So if we start this description at the point where the recording studio has produced the master tape of an album, a number of copies are run off that master tape and one of those copies will find its way to a cassette duplication facility. Now they would get that tape and they would run copies off it as well and put one of those copies into a machine called a loop bin duplicator and it would be held in there as a giant loop of tape and run around at great speed. It would be playing it and dubbing it to multiple attached slave recorders so it would produce a number of copies at the same time and once the recording process is completed on one of these slave machines the tape reel on it will contain a number of copies of the cassette album all joined together on one big reel so that reel is then taken off there loaded onto a tape winding machine where the tape is pulled off the reel put into cassette shells and spliced at the appropriate points if you want to see one of these machines in action i've got a link in the video description but hopefully you can see from my explanation that the duplication of the tape could involve you getting a cassette that was five generations of copies away from the master tape. And also bear in mind that the tape inside the bin loop machine could only produce a certain number of copies before it started to degrade in quality. Now duplication houses would regularly swap that tape loop out, but you might be unlucky buying a cassette in a store and finding you've got one right from the end of a run before they swap the tape over. Now, whilst this process wasn't ideal, very few things are. It was just the way that pre-recorded cassettes had been made for decades, so nobody really thought any the more of it, until the sales of albums on cassettes started to fall. 1990 had been a record year for cassette sales, but 91 saw them falling back a bit. Now, presumably, this wouldn't have been of a concern to the recording industry if those cassette sales had then been picked up by people swapping over to the more lucrative compact disc format, but it didn't seem that that was the case. The reduction in cassette sales had actually slowed the overall growth in music sales for the whole market. The WEA group of record labels thought they might have a way to slow down this trend or perhaps even reverse it, make people stop abandoning the cassette format. And it was through the use of improved duplication technologies. Many of the recording studios of the early 90s were now mastering to a digital file. So why not send that digital file off to the cassette duplication facilities? They could then load that into their machines and run the cassette copies from that. Effectively, each of these cassettes would be a first generation copy of the master recording. Now, whilst WEA were making all the noise about this, they weren't the inventors of this technology. There have been other versions of it first. This one from Ablex in the UK was described as storing the music on an enormous solid state six gigabit store that can hold nearly 100 minutes of stereo music. If you're interested, six gigabits is 750 megs. Now that might sound quaint nowadays, but consider that the digital bin machines could record this audio data onto cassette tape at 100 times normal speed. And that required some serious cutting edge digital to analog conversion for the day. Now, I don't know about you, but whenever I hear the term high speed dubbing, my heart still sinks. You see, I can recall the heyday of twin cassette decks in the 1980s, and they often had this feature on. But whenever you used it, you found that the copies it made were significantly worse than if you'd have done them at normal speed. 
Ask anyone who was a child in the 80s who tried copying their friends' Spectrum games across using high-speed dubbing. How successful that was. It was rarely met with anything other than a loading error. And more recently, albums are being sold mentioning that they've got half-speed mastering as a way to improve the sound quality. So surely dubbing a tape at up to 160 times normal speed would be a bad thing. Well, no. When it comes to using professional duplication equipment, it actually improves the recording. And that's because you're able to effectively eliminate any potential for the tape to pick up any wow and flutter. Wow and flutter are variances in the tape speed, but you can eliminate this if you record a whole tape in just a few seconds. It literally has no chance to experience any variances in speed. In addition, some reports I've read about the digital mastering system explained that it enabled a tape to be driven harder. You could put a stronger, louder signal on there, effectively driving it more into the red, but without distortion. And I'll explain more in a moment why this would be a good thing. I can see that some of you might now be losing interest, so let me try and spice this dull nonsense up. Here's something you might find interesting. If you've ever listened to a cassette, it's more than likely you'll have heard a fluttering noise, either at the end or the beginning of the tape, that sounds like this. Now, you've probably never given that sound a second thought, but then consider that the tape duplication machines that made that sound were running at 100 or more times normal speed. So let's speed this up 100 times and see what it should sound like. And that was it. In case you missed it, here it is again. And that beep is inserted onto the large tape reel at the end of each recording of the album. Then when that tape's loaded into the cassette winding machine, it knows where to splice it. Now, getting back on topic, you'd expect one of these digital bin systems would have to employ some sort of digital to analog converter because you need to convert the digital audio back to analog before you can put it onto the cassette tape. And indeed, this was how many of these systems worked. But apparently it was also possible to use an alternative method where you sent the digital PCM pulses directly through to an analog record head, which internally converted that into the signal which was recorded onto the cassette tape. Now this goes beyond my level of understanding, so I've linked to a video in the video description which demonstrates this technique. The only reason I mention this is because I was wondering if this last step in the chain is the thing that makes Digilog different from the other digital bins that were already on the market. So I went trying to find more information about Digilog and I didn't actually get very far. There was supposed to be a series of advertisements run in the July 2002 copies of a number of music magazines. However, after looking through my copies of these, I drew a blank. I did finally manage to find it in the August 2002 issue of Spin Magazine, and it's a very weak advert, very easy to miss, I think. I've put the text of the advert on the screen now so you can see what it was saying, and it really offers very little technical information. I'm still none the wiser as to whether Digilog is any different to anyone else's digital bin system. The only benefit from the Warner's WEA version is that they publicised it through the use of information on advertisements for uh, new albums coming out. Out, as well as by putting identifying stickers on the cassette boxes themselves. You'll notice that this advertisement refers to premium cobalt tape, and that brings us neatly onto our next 1990s tape improvement, new tape formulations. The two tape formulations that were commonly used at the time were ferric and chrome. As you can see from the information on screen, ferric could capture bass notes that chrome couldn't, whereas chrome was better at capturing the higher frequencies. The new cobalt formulation was able to capture the same frequencies as ferric, but could be driven four decibels harder. Effectively, it could capture more volume volume without distortion. In a previous video I demonstrated that tape has background hiss. The more you turn up your volume, the more the hiss becomes apparent. So if you're able to record louder music on a cassette tape, you don't need to turn the volume up as high to hear it, and then the hiss becomes less noticeable. The funny thing is that cobalt tape was nothing new. The improvements described on screen here were reported in a 1971 article from Popular Science. Anyway, over 20 years later, in 1992, they finally decided that cobalt tape was a good idea, and with the introduction of digital bins and their ability to impart better signals onto the tape, cobalt became more relevant. Sony said that by the end of 1993, all their new releases on cassette would be on cobalt tape. And when you look at the listed benefits, better frequency response, wider dynamic range, lower noise, elimination of problems with bass response, high frequency harshness and intermodulation, distortion, it seems like a no-brainer. 
Sony went on to say that once the benefits of cobalt tape were combined with the improvements brought by high-speed digital mastering, the consumer would see a dramatic difference in the quality of the music being presented. But never underestimate the short-sightedness of the other recording labels. At that time, ferric tape was being used for up to 90% of pre-recorded tapes. Switching over to the new cobalt tape formulations, which would have brought all the benefits we've just described, would have cost a tape manufacturer somewhere between 3 to 6 cents per pre-recorded cassette. This is for something that at the time cost them approximately 50 to 70 cents to make, which they could sell at retail for $6.97. And yet many of them decided they didn't want to pay a few more cents, so they stuck with good old ferric tape, thereby denying their customers the benefit of the improved sound that Cobalt could have brought. If you want a perfect example of short-sighted penny-pinching, this is it. Now, like many people, I stopped buying cassettes sometime in the early 90s and switched over to CDs. This is one of the last cassettes I bought from that era, and fortunately, it's a Warner Brothers cassette. It's from 1991, and as you can see on the right-hand side here, it's a Digilog cassette. Now, this is a year before the publicity campaign we mentioned earlier, so it uses a different version of the logo. Also inside, you'll notice the cassette mentions Dolby HX Pro. This was a technology that was introduced in the early 1980s by Bang & Olufsen, later licensed by Dolby. It enables cassettes to have better, higher frequency response, so it's particularly useful on low-grade ferric tapes to bring those up more in line with a chrome tape's high frequency response. And despite being introduced in the 80s, it became more common later on as the tape duplication facilities replaced their equipment with digital bins. They also took the opportunity to add in Dolby HX Pro encoding. Now, I can appreciate that my iced tea tape won't be the best way to experience the best that Digilog has to offer, given the fact that it'll be using samples and scratching and things. So I decided to go on eBay and see what else I could find that was on Digilog. And I managed to get hold of Prince's Greatest Hits tapes 1 and 2 from 1993. Now, I bought these at the earlier part of 2016 when Prince's stuff was considerably less collectible than it is now. And I was interested to find out what kind of Dolby noise reductions and systems were used on this. However, However, the logo on there is absolutely tiny, but when you zoom in, you can find it uses Dolby HX Pro and Dolby S. Now, it's extremely rare to find Dolby S used on a pre-recorded cassette, because whilst it can be decoded to some degree by Dolby B, it sounds best using a Dolby S tape deck. Now, I notice the tape in here looks like it's ferric. However, it could be a ferric cobalt mix because those were quite common. It's impossible to know by looking at it. However, when it comes to listening to the tapes, they do sound great. Here's a very short copyright friendly snippet and just listen for the silence in the break. Now, whilst that was only a very short snippet, you should be able to tell from that that it does have good dynamic range and very low levels of background noise. And in tests that I've done with friends and family, they all just thought that they were listening to a compact disc. Nobody guessed that it was a cassette. So all the improvements we've mentioned in this video were intended to increase the lifetime of the cassette format. In this article from 1992, the technology editor at Billboard expects cassettes to be around for another. 15 to 20 years, but in reality, cassettes were pretty much as good as dead within 10 years. Their prediction of things eventually going optical, or even to tiny computer chips, like most predictions of the time, didn't anticipate the disruption that MP3s and the internet would bring. Pre-recorded cassettes are, of course, still being produced, but only at a tiny fraction of the volumes they were in the early 90s, and none of the ones I bought recently appear to use any type of Dolby noise reduction systems or HX Pro, and they all seem to come on plain old ferric tape. Compared to the hi-fi tapes of the early 90s, nowadays they just seem to be treated more as fun, collectible novelties. However, it's more than likely that the tape duplicators are using a digital bin system because of its convenience, but it's by no means guaranteed. I have seen some recent adverts from companies Companies that duplicate tapes offering two different prices whether you want to duplicate using a digital bin or an analog tape loop. If you've kept hold of your old cassette collection and you were buying cassettes into the 1990s then have a look through them see if you can find any with that Digilog logo sticker on them. If you do pop it in your tape machine and have a listen I'm sure you'll be pleasantly surprised by the quality because contrary to popular opinion pre-recorded cassettes really could sound very good. Now remember, there's a couple of links in the video description text box, but that's it for the moment. As always, thanks for watching.
Well, this is boring nonsense. If I wanted to learn about extinct things from the past, I'd go to a museum. So why are you still watching it then? I'm waiting for the funny bit at the end. Have you ever thought that maybe he just adds those bits on at the end of videos that don't turn out so good? To distract you from noticing? Ha! Oh, that was a funny sketch. Very meta. Thumbs up. Great video. See? Sorry, I wasn't listening. You were saying something about being distracted. Was I?